Jill, you've committed the cardinal zoom sin and not taking yourself off mute. Well, <laughs> thank you, Stephen. You just needed me to make an appearance, didn't you? Have I, I did. I'll see you, I'll I see did. You later. It's so good to see your face. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome, everyone, to TRG30, Wednesday, February 17th, TRG30, where we are trying to talk every week about bold change for our sector's resilience uh, in 2021 today. Today, we're going to pick up where we left off in our last episode talking about philanthropy, but through an EDIA lens, equity, diversity, inclusion, and access. You all raised these questions here and in other sessions we've had, so I want to dive in now together and as always, I wanna cue you up to listen for some things. First, alignment, it's a big one. Is your organization your st key stakeholders, your leadership aligned around what EDIA, EDI may mean to you, your community, your artists, your staff? And do you have expectations? Is the work appropriately for right now departmental or departmentally only focused? Is it organizationally um, widespread? And for today's conversation, do you understand the relationship between this important work in your philanthropic efforts? And then always, what does it mean to your action? Listen today for the commitments and connections you can make that can translate to things you can do in 2021. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today, Rebecca Diaz. Rebecca is an EDIA consultant has worked extensively in arts and culture as an artist and an administrator. Recently, we got to know her and she met a group of art um, of development teams that we're, we've been convening um, here at TRG Arts over a series of sessions. And so she's here now with us in this broader setting so that together we can dig into this relationship and the opportunities between EDIA and philanthropy. Rebecca, welcome. And I'm going to, just so that everyone knows, pull myself off of screen share here in just a minute so we can see you more clearly. But before I do that, I have just a little bit more to share. So before I do that, tell us a bit about yourself and your approach to this work. Absolutely, and thank you, Jill. I'm, I'm so excited to be here today, and I'm, I'm so thrilled with uh, such a robust turnout to talk about this really important movement, motivation for the work we're doing. Um, yes, as Jill mentioned, I, I was an a, a, a artist for quite a while before I made the transition into the other side with uh, doing a lot of uh, programming, especially around social justice initiatives in the opera world. Um, the reason for that being is that my, my motivation and my start into the world of the arts came because of initiatives like this. I came from a very underserved, underprivileged background in, in the South Bronx, and it really was the arts that kind of motivated me to get where I am today. And so all of the work I do comes from this lens of how can we use art as a service to others? How can we find art and, and the things that are important to us as a way to create pathways for others moving forward? So everything that I do now is really based off the concept of inclusion first. How can we find out where we fit into the spectrum of IDEA and how do we find that for others? Okay, so big topic. I want to start with this um, little bit of a, a clean slate because Rebecca, in this group, there are people zooming in from different nations, different regions, different backgrounds, business models, personal experiences. And as a result, um, there are different, there's a different lexicon that is used across this work and across these spectrums. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about EDIA, and I want to invite you to help us hear um, the definitions of these terms in, in your sort of musical way. First, the definition that is sort of textbook, and I'll give everyone a second just to read the definition of equity uh, here. And you have, a, you have a way of thinking about this. Share it with us. Yes. Um, so we, yes, and you're absolutely right. We all have the idea of what these terms mean and how they fit together. And that's the most important thing when we look at EDIA is how do these terms actually mesh together uh, as opposed to being individual concepts. So equity, we want to think about this as if we're throwing a big party. 
So we're throwing a party. And if we're going to look at equity in terms of this party, that means that I've got some representation on my party planning committee that are going to be thinking about everyone coming to my party. So what does that mean? That basically means if I didn't have an equitable party planning committee, and I love dairy products, I might have a party full of, you know, cheese and milkshakes and things like that. But I'm not thinking about lactose intolerant people. So by having a lactose intolerant person on my party planning committee, I'm now being much more equitable in my planning of the party. Right. Okay. Equity really comes down to that concept. Yep. Okay. Yeah, please. Is, yeah, I'll just jump right into yeah, it. Please. Diversity is ensuring that for this party, everyone's getting an invitation. So diversity means that I'm giving invitations to everyone across, you know, race, gender, socioeconomic background, ability. So diversity, everyone gets an invitation. Equity, there is a representation of everyone to make sure this party is going to be enjoyable for those coming. Inclusion means that this party, now everyone showed up and they get a chance to dance at the party the way that they want to dance. They want to do a ballet routine, great. They want to do a break dance routine, fantastic. But inclusion is going to ensure that those party goers are going to really be able to enjoy the party as comfortable for them. And finally, access. Access means that everyone's going to have the space to enjoy the party in a fair and even a respectful manner. We're not going to make anyone have to go hang out in a corner. The chairs are going to be a good size for people to fit into and feel comfortable. So we have this kind of setup of this party mentality. So diversity means everyone gets that invitation. Inclusion means everyone gets to dance in their own comfortable way. Equity means that there's a say for everyone coming to the party so it can be really enjoyable. And access means that the party is comfortable for everyone in a respectful way. Yeah, this word respect is an important one, Rebecca, as I think about um, the intention of this work. And as a, as a little bit of a segue to that, I, I want to respect the fact that there are different nations in this room. Um, I got my hands on the Global Philanthropy Index that at IU School, Lilly School of Philanthropy, they, they publish. And, and on the main, we have North American and UK and Western European listeners to TRG30. And there are differences um, in the 2015 to, to 2018 time of this report. There were big policy shifts that happened in North America that had an impact on philanthropy in the UK and Western Europe. Um, there were new initiatives that were designed to help deal with and support the refugee crisis. The Data Privacy um, Act in Europe moved to the UK, GDPR, that created some shifts in infrastructure requirements and overhead for philanthropy. So they're just, there are different realities in the nations in which we operate. There's also a sector reality, and you and I have talked about this. In 2018, this is before the pandemic. Overall giving, and this their study is indeed global, overall giving um, to arts and culture was just 43% of giving. And the categories of giving that were more given to, I guess um, you'd say, are things like human rights, youth and family, health and medical research, primary and secondary education, basic needs. So I want to use that as a pivot to something that we've been talking about since the beginning of, of, the, of TRG30, which is our posture um, in the context of a pandemic. And as, as this relates to uh, philanthropy, you and I, um, in a previous conversation, talked about, and you were eloquent about the arts and cultural sector's need, um, opportunity, to expand our connections to the community in ways that might expand our impact in community in ways that might attract new donors actually and have a philanthropic impact. Let's start there. Can you describe what you're thinking about that today? Yes, and you know, it's interesting and I do think the pandemic kind of gave breath to people thinking about this in a, in a more holistic way. You know, when, when a lot of theaters had to get shuttered down, um, there was time to really think about the arts as more of a holistic medium. And we're in this tricky kind of situation where we combine right now with, with EDIA practices, a bottom line motivation, which of course is motivated by donor relations and, and money and grants and things like that, but also a very personal and a humanity kind of based motivation to this work. And if we think about how we can expand what we do in arts organizations, there really is a very organic 
kind of uh, synergy when it comes to creating programs and initiatives that really reach into human levels. And we see some companies start to do this in terms of things like accessibility, creating programs that work with underserved populations, creating programs that work with people along the spectrum of ability, autistic youth and things of, along that matter. And by doing that, we're able to kind of in, encapsulate donors that might not traditionally have wanted to support the arts, but they do want to support initiatives that help you know, youth. They want to help people along the spectrum of human ability. And so we can really find this really organic synergy between creating programs and initiatives with our companies that reach into that human level, that reach into that place to find a connection, to really be a pathway for others, to get a more robust life, a more expansive life, a more a world that's out of their reach by using the arts as that medium. Yeah, um, we, we spend time um, with our clients in TRG30 and other sessions talking about just cause and the just cause of arts and culture um, can and should be about um, live performance curated exhibits, the, the, the sort of magic of arts and culture in communities, but that magic um, can expand in ways you've talked about to touch human beings in more um, in more broad ways. Uh, an, another um, uh, conversation that this sparked for me that I'm I'm in regularly is okay in the context of the pandemic, Jill, and with this with this just cause in mind, um, we do let's. Um, uh, uh, speaking, you know, sort of aggregatedly, um, we do have a point of view about reaching um, different parts of our community, of changing um, uh, who we show up with to and who we consider community. We, we, we have that intention. And I'm the chief development officer, and I, I run a philanthropic program that by many measures has been very successful. Um, and it has asked people to give at certain levels. And it has provided access to certain, what we might think of as typical benefits. And as I listen to um, you, Rebecca, and as I think about where I need to go with this program, I feel like I have to blow up everything I have been doing and maybe even say goodbye to some donors um, to enable this new direction. Um, what do you say to, to, to me as the chief development officer who brings that concern to you? Well, you know, and I, I understand that. It's very frustrating with this kind of work because it's slow. There's no roadmap to this and change is very, very incremental. So we don't see, we don't see the results, the potential results we want. And we, we go to that idea of, oh, I'm going to blow the system up. I'm going to wipe the slate clean and I'm going to start from scratch. But that really isn't always the way to go. We kind of want to have more of this kind of, you know, overlaying of practices. I definitely would never recommend blowing up the system, getting rid of the benefits of, you know, things that have been in place forever for our traditional donors um, for a few reasons. First of all, not every company has that luxury of saying we're going to blow up the system and get rid of all of our, our lifeblood donors here. Secondly, we can use those existing benefits in a way to, to give equitable, equitable access to those that would otherwise not get that access. So I think about situations in which we can work with underserved populations to allow them into those benefit levels, into that donor dinner situation or that gala to give them that experience and exposure to another life that would otherwise, again, be out of their reach by giving those equitable access practices to those that are not, you know, paying with millions of dollars to be a donor there. So, what I would say, go ahead, Jill. Well, I was just going to say, so practically speaking, to provide that access then, what, what, what are we saying? Are we saying change the entry um, point, change the, the program, create a completely different program for well, different I think, relationships? Yeah, no, I think all of those. I think, I think that there needs to be a collaborative process. And, and again, you're not, we, all of this should start with a company-wide buy-in and mentality. For what's going on there no development department can exist on their own when it comes to idea work there needs to be that holistic support from everyone in the company so that the messaging is on point the programs are happening at the same time as the initiatives are happening and so yes i would say while continuing to have the benefits in place and the structure in place that have served the company there can be the creation of new programs and initiatives that are going to serve a new population of donors we can change the structure of how we how we offer benefits to people. Maybe we're not offering benefits to people 
based off of how much they're giving, but how much they're participating. Mm -hmm. How many times are they showing up to performances? How many times are they volunteering for things at the company? Mm -hmm. But then also using those benefits to give some access to marginalized populations that would otherwise never have that access in the first place, thus using those as tools to create more equitable programming for those that are outside the margin of our traditional donors, our traditional audiences. Yeah, spectrum logic. I see that point. It's it, There is a spectrum of people whom we're expanding the conversation with. And, you know, conversation and relationship, that, that word um, feels like it's critical in the development of these programs, not to do to, but to engage in conversation with um, as I say those words to you, do things come to your mind about what that shift requires of, of departments and people and practices? The very first thing, and, and this is, this is um, interesting because, I, again, I talk about how this is frustrating work. And if we look at the model of compliant EDIA corporations, we're looking at corporate America, there's mm -hmm. basically a five, five steps you arrive at before you get to be an advanced organization. So our first step is going to be compliant, then it's conventional then purposeful, then competent, and then finally advanced. And mm -hmm. I think we are we are mentally at a stage where we, we want to be advanced. We want to jump into that place where we can start using EDIA as a measurable practice to create initiatives, to see results, and to take it to the next level. But really as an industry, I think that we're kind of just between compliant and conventional, step one and step two. Mm -hmm. So one of the first steps really needs to be that understanding and evaluation of where is your company. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I would absolutely recommend a full company audit just to understand what do you have in place? What is the mentality of the organization and the company culture and how we approach EDIA? Is there an EDIA statement? Are there, are there departmental uh, buy-in about what's going on? And that is really the first step is figuring out where are we and what are our explicit goals going to be as a corporation to get to that next step? We can't have development departments kind of going out there blind and, and hoping for the best. It really has to start at home with setting those explicit goals if they're not already in place. I love this idea that we want to jump from compliance to advanced. <laughs> it's very human, right? We want to get there and be good at something right now. And um, uh, boy, do I know in our own company's work how um, that resonates with me a whole lot. Um, starting at the beginning with an understanding about where the organization is and where there is alignment and where there isn't. I'm, you and I, um, I'm gonna invite Steven to join us here in a minute so that he's fielding the right questions at the right time. But you and I started talking about, um, and I in fact you know, said, it's the first question I asked, where is the organization as it relates to this work? top-down system-wide, understanding that is an important first step. I'm not sure it fits in compliance. Maybe it, maybe it does in your stepwise approach, but it's the first step, isn't it? Yes, it certainly is. And, and it's important, you know, and we see a lot of very big initiatives happening, especially during the pandemic, in terms of organizations being called out for their compliance issues, for their, you know, their racial equality issues. And without having that, that top-down buy-in, that, that top-down you know, motivational, com complete, you know, 360 understanding of what is our message for this? Where are we going to, where are we going to go with this? It has to be holistic. It has to be a, a big collaboration in terms of that. You know, um, Stephen, I want you to come on camera now, but I'm reminded of a conversation that we, or a question that we got when we were together last that kind of sparked this um, interest to take this further, it was from our friend Kurt, and he was asking about um, listening to non-traditional communities and um, some, some level of, of resistance to wanting to collect information and data so that we could measure ourselves against our intention and resistance from non-traditional communities from uh, to check boxes and and self-identify in predictable ways. And he was curious about if there was a nuanced or expert way to do that. And I'm curious, Rebecca, it's a tactic, but a, but a, but grounded in an intention. And I wonder what you would counsel here. Yes, and it really is a, it is a very big issue. We do see this quite a lot with data and data can be biased and we can always alter the data to kind of dictate what we wanna see at the end of it. And I think a lot of times marginalized populations are aware of that. 
Um, and there's also traditional bias against people self-identifying because they don't really know to what end is this. And so I think the first step when you're doing any kind of data, data analysis is to be very clear as to why are you doing this in the first place? To what end is this happening? What are we hoping to see out of this? What are we hoping to get out of this? And then importantly, is that well communicated to the populations that are filling out this data in the first place? It all comes down to intentionality. And I think if if your if your demographics are aware of what why are we getting why are we asking this and what will happen after I fill this this out? What kind of actionable you know accountability what will I see once this is filled out and once my I share my innermost personal attributes? That's going to help with letting people feel more comfortable with being honest and open about things, being very very clear about why and then what will happen after. Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And welcome to Ben. Ben, I'm going to kick off with Ben's question, which is a great question. The discussion today at times has felt that it assumes who constitutes the we that are issuing invitations to the party and who are creating new initiatives, especially as organizations, many of whom have significantly downsized during COVID, will be moving to rehire or staff up. What advice can be offered about the work organizations need to be doing now in advance of that rehiring and management of different generational expectations about how much can, should, and must be blown up? And um, you know, I would I would tether onto that a question from Noel, which is as job opportunities come along within an organization, how do you go about increasing the diversity of your applicants? First, I want to say to that. What is also important to keep in mind as we're thinking about hiring and, and um, diversifying our, our staff is to keep the ideas of equitable actions in mind. Where are we, what, let's say we get a whole bunch of diverse candidates, that'd be a wonderful problem to have. Where are we putting those diverse candidates? Where are we seeing those people go? Is there a tokenistic approach in that we're hiring diverse candidates for the lowest level positions for the companies? Or are we diversifying that throughout the company to ensure that we have people in positions of, of leadership and power that are diverse. And that kind of goes into the first question you asked Stephen about, you know, how do we ensure who's, who's, who's throwing this party in the first place? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have people at the top that are throwing the party of different diverse backgrounds, then we end up having uh, not more, more along the lines of what's called um, pseudo inclusion, which is this idea of either assimilation or differentiation, which is kind of tokenism and, and tokenistic practices. So it really has, we have to see a, a, an entire holistic approach of where we're we putting in diverse candidates. And I, I'd like to challenge what we think about as diversity. We often think of diversity in terms of gender and race, and perhaps if we're being very progressive uh, age and generation and orientation. But there are so many other levels of diversity that we don't often take into consideration of these primary and secondary dimensions of what is my socioeconomic status? What is my parent status? What is my marital status? What is my affiliation with certain things. And we want to think about a very big diversity of thought in addition to a diversity of demographics. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the second part of that question with how do we get diverse candidates in the first place? Well, this is the age old question. And, you know, I, I've talked a lot with organizations about, well, how do we find these candidates? Is there a, a secret um, job listing site somewhere out there for diverse candidates? And I can tell you as, as a diverse person from my youth looking for jobs, you scour looking for jobs everywhere you can. There's no magical treasure trove of diverse candidates waiting to be found. We really have to start thinking about, a, I hate the word pipeline, but a mentorship aspect to organizations. There needs to be that, that, that entry level point for diverse candidates who may not have traditionally had the training and the expertise or the, or the financial gains to go along the traditional university, um, you know, um, and then apprenticeship kind of, kind of methodology we go with here. So instituting mentorship programs within your organizations are going to be a great way to get a more diverse pool of applicants. Um, but I would make those very actionable and advocacy based where we're going to see these these mentors and these mentees working together to actually create pipeline projects for these these individuals to get hired and not just kind of give them the training and then send them on their merry way. So it has to be a, a two step approach, I think. Uh, another point of diversity, Jill, that you referenced at the beginning is the cultural diversity we have with us today, right? And mm -hmm. the data shows that there are clear cultural differences in how people donate and to what causes. I wonder, Rebecca, how can we be thoughtful about that? And, and is maybe that part of the audit that you referenced as a, as a first step? Yes, I think the audit's a great first way to figure it, just to take the temperature of where, we, of where you are, because it's very difficult to, to make any change if you're not sure what the base level is. There's got to be that, that base level of understanding what's going on. But then in terms of, of, the, of the cultural you know, competency and the cultural approach to this, 
um, I really would lean heavily on the accomplice of inclusion because inclusion of, of all of these at these IDEA, the inclusion really leans on the, the personhood of someone and what is important to them. And yes, it's a lot of work sometimes to have to see what is that intersectionality of a person. You know, we're not all one dimension. We all don't care about one thing or we all, all, don't, all don't identify with one thing. But the intersectionality really plays a very important role in understanding what are all the facets of a personality? What are all the facets that someone cares about? And how can we look at that in a broader scope to make all of those little points come together when we're looking at more culturally, culturally wide approaches for, for, for giving? Um, Stephen, I just, Rebecca, I, as you say that, this word inclusion, and I so appreciate that you surface that there are differences between us that we might not be able to immediately see. And I come back to this issue of relationship. And sometimes when I read the literature, I hear inclusion. And then the next step of that being belonging and feeling like I, I don't, I'm not just included so that I feel comfortable dancing, but I'm actually informing the party. And as I think about philanthropy, I think about the relation that that reality, if I'm, if I as an institution am desirous of creating new donors, making it practical for a moment, um, uh, being open to allow donors to inform how we show up, um, that requires not just the tactics, but this organizational alignment called, yes, this really matters, doesn't it? I mean, it, that is where the rubber hits the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stephen, can we do have time for one more question, I think? Or I mean, a question around governance here from um, Lenore. Uh, the process of where staff engages the board to comply. We appreciate holistic need, but sometimes boards don't like change. <laughs> yes, that is very, very true. Um, and I, especially in, in the arts, you know, and, and I, I can I can actually probably line up which organizations have the more, more um, boards that are a little more uh, adverse to this. You know, we're, we're in the opera world, in the ballet world, and you know, the theater world. Where do we see this this kind of happening? And I think it's it's it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, a board member, a traditional board member, did not join an arts company to be an IDEA advocate. They joined an arts company because they were drawn to the art. And so we can't we have to be gentle with boards. And I know that might not be the most PC or or you know. Um, well supported mentality, but I do very much strongly believe we have to be gentle with our boards because there was something there that drew them to us in the first place. And it needs to be, again, a very inclusionary focused approach to the board. We have to, we have to approach board members with the idea that you belong in this conversation as much as anyone else. And so approaching those, those workshops and discussions and trainings with the board in terms of how do you fit into IDA? What are your diversity factors? Where can you be part of this conversation? Because then we give the board empowerment to be advocates of change, as opposed to resistant to the change. Like, well, no, I don't fit in anymore. Well, no, you're going to be now empowered to help us with this journey and al along this process. And again, it is not easy. This is not an easy formula where you say this and this is gonna be the result. These are, these are very ongoing conversations. They're difficult conversations and they take a lot of time and they take a lot of breathing moments to get through difficult things, but this it's worth the difficult conversations. It's worth the difficult back and forth to find that connection and that authentic connection. Boy, boy, oh boy, that is that that is the point. It is worth it. It is long term. Mm -hmm. It is part of the just cause of our being organizations in communities that make and have a difference. Stephen, I just I want to bring us to um, sort of a, a final um, point here around some um, some of our wrap up uh, orientation. I wonder if you'd take us take us home here. Yeah, sure. Well, Rebecca, first, I want to say thank you so much for being with us today. There are other questions flying in, and so we'll find the right way to respond to those. Uh, don't forget to continue um, to support uh, the sector with your participation in our benchmark. Um, there is a brand new interface that's just been launched. So if you've not logged in for a while, I would encourage you to do so and see your data now visualized against two years of benchmark uh, data. Um, finally, uh, our website has a host of resources that we'll continue to add to over the coming weeks, including today's virtual roundtable with Rebecca. And we'll be back in two weeks for our next TRG30. So I hope you'll find a way to join us. 
um, with a virtual cup of tea or coffee or, or, or something else. But thank you for your time. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank Rebecca, you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for this important conversation. So much more to come. So much more to come. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.